Hi everyone, my name is Angela Walter and I'm the U.S. Field Science Director for Fab Ray Disease. We're part of the Rare Medical Genetics team here at Santa Fe. Thank you for tuning in. This is our first episode of a new medical video podcast series entitled 9 Minutes and 59 Seconds Science Talk for Fab Ray Disease. The objective of this series is really to explore unmet medical needs. So we want to learn more about what's experienced by, by patients and families living with Fabry disease. So we'll be speaking with patients, patient advocacy leaders, as well as physicians, trying to better understand where they feel the unmet needs may lie. Our medical affairs team seeks to partner with you, the physician community, um, as well as the patient community, as we all collectively pursue our mission for greater understanding together. Today's first podcast will explore the topic of fatigue in females with Fabry disease, and joining us today are Mrs. Julia Alden and Dr. Robert Hopkin. Julia, um, in addition to living with Fabry disease herself, is the executive director of the Canadian Fabry Association based in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, Julia will be speaking from her own experience, as well as sharing insights gathered by conversations that she's had with members of the female Fabry community. Um, known to many of you, Dr. Robert Hopkin, of course, is a professor of clinical medical genetics at the Cincinnati Children's Medical Center based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Hopkin has cared for more than 100 Fabry patients and their families over the years, and he's authored more than 30 peer-reviewed publications on this topic. We're grateful to have them both. So let's get started. Hi, Julia. Welcome to the podcast. Julia, as a patient advocate and as a female with Fabry disease, could you help us better understand what Fabry disease-related fatigue is really like? Angela, it is my pleasure to be part of this podcast because we're talking about a subject that, in my opinion, is a piece of the puzzle that is crucial in helping us understand how to better support the body. It's important to talk about the impact Fabry has on the heart, kidneys, and other parts of the body. But it is also important to talk about the impact Fabry fatigue plays on a person's everyday life. So thank you for having me join the conversation today. Speaking from my own experiences, as well as the experiences shared with me in the Fabry community, fatigue feels like not having enough energy to do the things you want to do. It's knowing what you're capable of, having the drive, but missing the energy to do them. Fabry fatigue can make women feel lightheaded, dizzy, and overall, not well. It's similar to when you're fighting a virus. Your body feels weak and your head feels cloudy. Many doctors suggest the triggers seem to be in line with the general population. Things like lack of sleep, emotional exhaustion, doing too much, and anything that places stress on the body. But as I talk with other women who have Fabry, we wonder if it's actually the underlying Fabry fatigue that contributes to or even causes some of our emotional exhaustion, heightened experience of pain, poor sleep quality, and impaired resilience to physical stressors. Speaking for the Fabry community, we'd like to know why fatigue feels like such a significant daily part of our lives, even when other organ systems are stable. Here is a really important question, Julia. Um, thank you for sharing these insights. Could I also, also ask you from your experience, um, what impact or level of burden does Fabry fatigue have on the daily lives of women with Fabry disease? We all know what it feels like to not have a good night's sleep. It's a feeling every listener can relate to. I know I always experience more pain and have more heart palpitations when my body is fatigued from poor sleep. And understanding the correlation between poor sleep quality and Fabry is essential because at the root, we know sleep restores the body and plays a critical role in our immune function, metabolism, cardiovascular health, healing, and mental health. Sleep disorders are associated with a wide range of detrimental health consequences. And collectively, Fabry patients are saying they have trouble sleeping and we need to figure out why. We know pain, sleep apnea, anxiety, and mental health can be factors, but what don't we know? And if these factors are absent, could there be other causes? For example, do circadian rhythm disorders, oxidative stress, inflammation, or heart-related issues play a role? Getting good sleep is such an important part of overall health, but most women with Fabry tell me their doctors never ask them about their fatigue or quality of sleep. I am a wife, a mom of two sweet young children, and executive director of the CFA. 
I don't want anything to hold me back. And Fabry related fatigue is one of those things. It is impacting my life. And it gets more complicated when the fatigue is accompanied with other Fabry symptoms. When I'm running around the backyard with my kids, my hands and feet are hurting and I'm not feeling my best. It's the simple moments like these when I feel the most impact from Fabry fatigue. The day-to-day -day living when you have so much to give, but feel the limitation. So as a woman living with Fabre, I look forward to learning how we can be more proactive and what we can do in our control to combat Fabre associated fatigue. Thank you so much, Julia. We really do appreciate you sharing your experience and sharing the concerns of other women in the Fabre community. This is really helpful. Thank you. So Dr. Hopkin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you heard Julia's story, and I know that you work with a very large clinic population yourself. How would you characterize the fatigue that's experienced by women with Fabry disease? We don't really know what causes it, but I believe that the fatigue is a neurologic manifestation of Fabry disease, uh, similar to the neuropathic pain. Patients with Fabry disease simply sleep less, experience lower quality sleep, have early awakening, trouble falling asleep, and increased limb movements while they sleep. So all of these factors contribute to chronic fatigue and sometimes daytime, overwhelming daytime sleepiness. Uh, my patients report that they lose work because of this. It has an impact on their ability to get through just the acts of daily living. And there have been studies looking at women with febre disease that report the sleep disturbance is much greater than the general population. About 10% of the general population report daily fatigue, about 70% of people with Fabry disease. So do you think that females with Fabry disease experience fatigue differently than males? I'm not sure that they experience it differently. It is reported frequently by both men and women, but in my experience, it's clearly not milder in the women. Plus the social roles that women take make this more pertinent for them. For example, the ability to push through a complete eight hour day at the end of the day for a male, a lot of times they're done with the day. For women, they get to that point in the day and they are expected to manage the household, take care of the children, get the meals ready, etc. So a lot of mothers tell me that Cooking dinner is a big task. They have to take a break in the middle of that. Then when they get the meal on the table, they don't sit down and eat with the family. They sit down and rest. And then after the meal, when they're cleaning up, they need another break again. This is a big burden on women. And I think it's a negative impact on quality of life. Well, Dr. Hopkin, based on your clinical expertise, do you believe that fatigue in females with Fabry disease is solely a function of having a chronic illness, or do you think that there might be some underlying pathology that we don't yet understand? So Fabry disease is a chronic illness, so we have to assume that some of that is related. However, that should correlate with the severity of the disease in general, if that's the main driver. And there is no correlation with the heart disease, the kidney disease, how severe the pain is, the GI symptoms. Uh, they've looked at some specific things like mild, like obstructive uh, sleep apnea, and it's too mild to account for the fatigue in women. Anemia has been looked at, and there is some anemia, but it's mild enough that it shouldn't lead to any fatigue in most cases. Um, so... There is some correlation with risk for depression and um, the fatigue, but it's not a tight enough correlation that it makes it. I think it's just an independent manifestation of febre disease that we need to account for. So people describe febre disease as resulting in just a general lack of energy um, or just saying my body just feels too heavy to move, and I can't do things. Uh, that is important. And so it overlaps with other things, but it seems to be an independent 
manifestation of febrile disease. So as a physician, um, how do you address fatigue in your clinic population? So I think the most important thing in addressing fatigue in febrile disease is to acknowledge that it exists, that it's important, and it's not just a complaint, and it's not just a chronic disease. Um, and then we need to find ways of measuring it. And I think that will be best done using validated scales. Uh, in clinical practice, what do I do? I ask, well, what can you do? Can you do the laundry? Can you do the shopping? Can you get meals on the table? Can you, you know, what are the fat brain related limitations? Then how often do you need a nap? How long are your naps? Typical general population naps are 15 to 20 minutes. Typical febrile disease naps are 70 to 90 minutes, and they're more frequent. Uh, there are not validated interventions for fatigue and febrile disease. So what I do is talk to the person about what's interrupted in their life, what are the goals that they need to address most, and try to come up with plans for that. I think we owe it to this population to understand the fatigue so we can more directly address it and improve quality of life. Thank you, Dr. Hopkin, and thank you again, Julia. We really appreciate both of you sharing your time and your experiences to bring attention to this important topic. And to our listeners, thank you so much for joining this podcast. Um, we're delighted that you're here, and I'll close with a question for you guys to ponder. Um, in your clinics and in your practice, how do you measure fatigue? Specifically with your Fabry patients who are female, do you bring it up? Do you address it? Um, and then finally, something to think about, what can the collective medical community do to better support women with Fabry related fatigue? Please join us again soon for our next episode of 9 Minutes and 59 Seconds, Science Talk for Fabry Disease. Thank you.